Kim Johnson. My topic is thorium and fluorides. Energy Kim engineered on the fly. The nuclear differences of thorium and uranium are thorium, which is 100% 232, and uranium, which is 99.3% 238, have different half lights Over 14 billion years for plentiful thorium and 4.5 billion for uranium. The abundance of thorium is equal to lead but much better because it's where you find it is pretty concentrated, like in Brazil and India, even Australia and, and, and the U.S. too. It's four times as abundant uranium. It's easily bred into the fuel that fissions more efficiently and forms far fewer long-lived trues than U-238. There's less than a 1% probability of U-233 that comes from thorium going past uranium into Neptune or Pluto. But uranium via plutonium-239 is pretty piss poor because only less than two-thirds fissions under thermal neutrons, which are easy to engineer for. There's some chemical differences between thorium and uranium also. After Earth's atmosphere had built up enough free oxygen, thanks to wonderful photosynthesis, oxygen-bearing waters began oxidizing uranium to its hexavalent state. Hexavalent uranium compounds, in contrast to uh, primordial tetravalent uranium, are all quite soluble in water, like sulfates. Leached by water, U compounds were widely dispersed. And having been scattered far and wide, U compounds today are found as complex, generally dilute deposits containing mixtures of tetra, penta, and hexavalent uranium. Unlike uranium, tetravalent thorium, and it's constantly tetravalent, resists weathering. Its most common forms in nature are thoria, a nickname for thorium dioxide, thorium phosphate, and thorium silicate. And they're all totally insoluble in water at all natural pHs. Thoria containing solid fuel is therefore considerably costlier to fabricate and reprocess than UO2 solid solo. Thorium thus remained concentrated where it first wound up, within easy reach in Earth's primordial deposits of rare earths. Geochemical kinship with the rare earths. Rare earth elements or rees are a large part of the ash of ancient stars. Trivalent metals with practically identical chemistry. Chemical magnets within the Earth for thorium. And they form with thorium a dynamic duo for a living planet. And lastly, and maybe most importantly for our politicians, they are reminders that the U.S. must rebuild the industrial and intellectual property base we once had and develop the best use of thorium. Turning back to big stars, half of the elements heavier than iron, including rare earths, form gradually in big stars during the course of their large stellar lives. However, supernova's huge neutron burst synthesized during the first 15 minutes of detonation about half of all elements heavier than iron that exist today, and all elements past bismuth and most radioisotopes, or RIs. Once the supernova blasts everything deep into space, some RIs actually experience spontaneous fission, particularly all the even-numbered plutonium isotopes, which make even-numbered plutonium isotopes hell for bomb makers. This spontaneous fission enriches planet-forming stardust with additional rare earth elements, and they comprise about 40% of all primordial fission products. Rees have practically identical chemistry among themselves, and they include lanthanum through lutetium. You can see lanthanide series in blue, yttrium right next to zirconium, and pretty rare scandium next to titanium. They're exclusively trivalent metals, M plus 3 except for cerium, which is also tetravalent, and thorium, which is typically the third most abundant metal after cerium and lanthanum in, in most re deposits. Very importantly for our lives, rees are chemical magnets for thorium. The early molten earth crystallized from the base of its primordial mantle upward. Rees weren't chemically compatible with most everything in the earth's crust, and neither was uranium or thorium dioxides. The red last to freeze layer just under the thin new earth's crust is largely rare earth gathered radioisotopes. And that froze, and sometime after 50 million years of age, that primordial crust cooled, lost buoyancy, and began to subduct into the now solid mantle. The subducting crust dragged the earth's re rich region, now solidified and adhering strongly to the early crust deep into the mantle. Most likely location today for the Earth's early re-rich region is the core mantle boundary. Geologists call this layer the D-double prime. It averages 200 kilometers in thickness. 
Each area of D deforms in response to what the mantle above it is doing. Where you see green subducting plates, you get high pressure cell and that makes the regions of D lying below the slabs thinner and thus cooler because there's more pressure going down. However, the mantle plumes, uh, you know, like under Hawaii and Yellowstone, stretch the height of D layer beneath and makes D under mantle plumes generate even more heat and sustains our planet's many hot spots plate tectonics, and things that are essential to keep our biosphere vital. So Re and Thorium form a dynamic duo for a living planet. Dynamic core. Molten metal iron moving in complex convection currents is the mechanism for geomagnetism. Enabling this long-lasting convection are Thorium, Uranium, and Potassium-40 in re-rich D resting on the iron core. Two to four billion years ago, uranium and potassium generated up to 80% of this decay heat. However, it is long-lived thorium that provides the bulk of RI heating that sustains geomagnetism today. And this resulting magnetic field sustains life by deflecting the solar wind and keeping it from stripping away our atmosphere and water. The lack of thorium was the kiss of death for this lovely planet. It wasn't endowed with enough thorium and other RIs to slow its internal cooling enough, so Mars suffered iron core solidification. This shut down Mars' magnetic field. 99% of its atmosphere and practically all water upon the surface of the red planet. A loss to the solar wind. Fortunately, we live on a well-endowed planet. Thorium plus fluorides. We can employ this pair to keep Earth's economy not only alive but healthy, much like thorium maintains the living geology of our planet. Where thorium and fluoride salts come together is LIFTER, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. This alliance is a firm one of chemistry and physics and involves T and FIs, short for thorium and fissile isotopes, whose mission is to fission from neutron addition. F salts or fluoride salts and FPs or nuclear fission products. In fact, Fluoride chemistry is the very key to nuclear affordability. Fluoride chemistry enables lifter to be efficient. It lets it economically and easily refuel on the fly and at full power. It removes various volatile fission product fluorides at full power operation. And it controls fuel salt buildup of rare earths and other involatile FPs that would otherwise waste valuable neutrons. Let's do some refueling on the fly. Fuel salt that's running low on nuclear fuel irreducibly receives more in fluid form. The first case is 20% enriched UF6 fresh from centrifuging. Although up to 60% of D-lifter's energy could come from inbred thorium, the 40% difference is made up of a supplemental feed of this very fluid and easy to add form of low enriched uranium. You notice on the second case, the MFX vapors that dilute and entrain fissile uranium pentafluoride, UF5, from the blanket to the core. They will be defined in the next slide. MFX, multivalent fluorides for azeotropes and corrosion control. M's, or metals and or metalloids, chosen from the shaded elements you see here, fill the bill, either chemically and or physically. A typical example of a versatile MFX is antimony, pentafluoride, or SBF5. In the liquid phase, it's self-ionized, forming tetrafluoroantimonium hexafluoroantimoninate. So it's easier to say just liquid SBF5. In the vapor phase, SBF5, like all of these other MFXs, form dimers and trimers that tend to entrain other higher fluorides, like a vapor phase over, you know, hot boiling SBF5. And it'll stay in the fuel salt, you know, to a few percent if you want it to, without pressurization. You see how the structure is like, you know, little kitty toys where you stick things together like um, beads. And it can sandwich in between uranium pentafluoride, which is not nearly as volatile as hexafluoride, but it's a pentafluoride, so, it, you know, it's like a, a, you know, a similar twin. And here's an example of uh, a fission product, moly pentafluoride. It gets sandwiched in and it carries off. When it condenses, it comes back out. We can also use MFX to control corrosion in the fuel salt. Reducing the oxidation state of MFX to MFX minus one greatly reduces corrosion from fission products in the fuel salt. With uh, the fuel salt kept slightly reducing, Hastelloy and other valuable materials construction is protected from grain boundary corrosion. Here's reduced form of MF4. It's an equilibrium between metal bonds with you know four fluorines on each, or it can disproportionate to MF3 and MF5, 
And the MF3 has a lone electron pair, which is very promiscuous and kind of looks at the MF5 to make the MF5 think it's MF6 or something like that. It just sticks onto anything like a naked fluoride ion. The slightly reducing fuel salt protects structures by tying up as complex anions elemental fission products that would otherwise compromise structures. Now, the nasty fission products, you know, in the early days of MSR research, we're not the halogen FPs. You know, you've heard of halogens, you know, fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Well, we do get bromine and iodine as major fission products, but we also get even more because they're even numbered elements, even numbered protons. Selenium and tellurium, they're known as the calcogens, the calcogen FPs. When a reduced MFX sees a polymeric mess of tellurium and selenium because they think they're siblings, you know, they're long chain polymers, not volatile at all, they played out onto and attack nickel grain boundaries because they'd rather be a telluride or a selenide and they think they're bearing, you know, making copper, selenium and sulfur compounds. It actually makes this insoluble calcogen chain into something ionic. Positive charge on the MF3 and a negative charge on the end of the tellurium tail. So they're soluble in salts and they stay away from our valuable nickel alloys until we can fluorinate them out. We want to hold on to the tellurium too. So a lot of guys pay ridiculous amounts for it for like solar power. <laughs> here, is, here is the top 10 neutron absorbing sufficient products versus all other. And this is a solid zirconium rod case, unfortunately. That's the data that Jess, Gene of Oak Ridge provided. And you can see the big line starts around 65% and goes down. That's nasty xenon 135. And the next worst thing, the yellow line is samarium, not a good Samaritan. <laughs> Here's something more enlightened from France, although they're operating in an epithermal spectrum. Here's the elemental molten salt reactor inventory. Elements 34 and 36, selenium and krypton are missing, but not bromine, because bromine forms an anion, so it is kind of like a weak chloride or fluoride anion. You see a number 40, the really big peak. Zirconium was one of our major fission products, but we can't really sell that because a lot of it's radioactive. You know, there's uses for all these things in there, and the ones that are missing were just removed from simple fluorination and sparging with whatever inert gas you care to do. Or you could use MFX to sparge them and save on helium. This is from the French research team headed by Elsa Merle. This is with noble and fluorinatable or effable fission products only periodically removed. And the worst thing that remains is this giant samarium pane, neodymium, and then promethium, which is good for batteries and medical stuff. And you won't get it from any other reactors except lifter easily. And since they're fluorides, and you can use low melting fluoride salts, like selenium fluorides, you can separate these, you know, have to get them out of the reactor and then sell them to whomever, if, you know, if there's a market. With adequate chemical engineering, thorium and fluorides make a really good system and you can adjust it on the fly without pushing and pulling mechanical stuff. Uh, are there any questions? So like Solar City, are you gonna are you gonna plan to offer uh, lease only, no down payment lifters? Well, no, I'm not in the business and I'm only on the technical end. That's that's up to people like Kirk and Jim and other guys. <laughs>